A few months ago, Marianne Buddy, who is the Bishop of Washington, D.C., she gave a sermon which she titled, Discover the Gospel of Your Life. She said that there are things in our lives that we discover, things that have always been there, but we have now just recognized them. And she encouraged us to reflect on that and on our life story. Today's reading from Hebrews just so happens to be one of my favorite scriptures. And in reflecting on it, I discovered that it is indeed part of my gospel story. It is a story of encouragement, a story of hope, and a story that asks us not to neglect to meet one another. Many of you have come together over these last several weeks, and you have shared your stories and your experiences during times of struggle and grief. Recently, we have heard very traumatic stories from Congresswomen who are brave enough to share their very personal experiences over women's rights. It takes courage to share one's story, and more so when our safety and our security at our stake. Some of you may have mustered that courage as you shared your life with each other. And I suspect those Congresswomen had to muster courage. And it is no different for me today. My story is a story of a gay woman. Growing up in a white middle class family, struggling with my identity just as many youth do. But what made it particularly difficult for me was battling the societal norms over who I am as a person. This is not a new phenomenon. Many, many LGBTQIA individuals continue to endure oppression that revolves around the question of whose life is it. Years of struggling with this question has caused me much anxiety and much grief. Many who are part of the LGBTQIA community deal with societal oppression every day of our lives. For me, this oppression looked like physical damage to my personal property, cruel words, name calling, tokenism, idle curiosity, workplace bullying, tearing down of pride flags, and just flat out discrimination. Individuals that I thought were my family and my friends, the state that I live in, the federal government that I pay taxes to, and even the church have attempted to dictate to me how I should live my life. There are some individuals who say we all need to get over it. We all have the same rights. But do we? How do we, when an individual who I considered a friend offers to pay off a debt of the church, if the church will make the issue of LGBTQIA justice go away? Let us reflect on this. And let us just reflect on a simple question. How many times has the pride flag been torn down here at St. Dunstan's? Take a moment and reflect on what's happening to the women in Texas as the state dictates to them how they should live their lives. Reflect on what is happening to our BIPOC, our black, indigenous, people of color, brothers and sisters. Ask yourselves the question, what group will be targeted next? 
societal pressures on who one can love and how I am to live my life has continued for over 60 years. And just when we in the gay community think that there is hope, the cycle seems to repeat itself. Institutional systems are strong. And I found that resilience, resilience is the key and it's necessary because continued explaining exhausts me to my bones. I am tired of trying to explain to another when they ask questions like, who, will, who takes out the garbage? When in reality, they're searching for the answer of what role do each of you play in the relationship? Trust in a loving God is also key. A God who has provided me with a marketplace. And I find encouragement when I shop there, when I shop in that marketplace. A marketplace, as a friend once described it, as family, friends, and community. I find hope in the marketplace of folks like Harvey Milk, Jojo Siwa, Ellen DeGeneres, Matthew Shepard, and many of you who have spoken truth to power. Courageous individuals who stand up to those who cause harm to others by performing simple acts of love. A simple act by replacing, yet again, the gay pride flag. Courageous individuals who are willing to tackle the question and ask themselves, are all really welcome at God's table? Discovering myself and telling my story is hard work. And I think it has been hard for several of you as well. Things are not always black and white when it comes to topics like how one should live one's life. Many find it easier to see things in black and white rather than to be challenged by shades of gray. You know, in the Anglican tradition, we have and talk about that three-legged stool, scripture, tradition, and reason. I believe that reason is the hardest because of the gray areas that we have to enter into in order to meet another. Listening and really hearing another person's story requires effort. It requires us to be open enough to enter into that grayness. And in the process, not exhaust those who are marginalized and oppressed by asking them to engage in a conversation because of one's own idle curiosity. Each of us is asked to do our own hard work of systemic oppression and not victimize those on the margins of society by asking us to persecute ourselves. We, like the Hebrews, are asked to enter into a process that causes us to have to reflect on the conflicts and disputes among us. The Apostle Paul asked the Hebrews to, to meet one another. He recognized that there were gray areas, and he also knew they were fond of their ways of thinking and of Levitical dispensation. Paul explained to the Hebrews that Leviticus, though it was of divine appointment, was useful in its time and place. Yet when compared to Christ, it was only designed to lead people and not to make them disciples. Paul felt it was necessary 
to show the weakness and imperfection of Leviticus. He not only asked the Hebrews to reflect on the conflicts and disputes among them, but he asked them to consider the gray areas of life and how they might encourage one another to love and to good deeds. He encouraged them to meet one another and asked them to encourage each other daily while it is still today. Paul attempted to point out to them that the value and the place of Leviticus, he, he tried to point out what the value of that book was. And growing up, believe me, I struggled with that book. But what I found most harmful was not the book itself, but rather its interpretation by those who considered themselves in the know. It was in wrestling with that book, with societal pressures, institutional discrimination, and many other things, where I discovered my gospel story. I discovered that I was given a gift. I was given the gift of freedom to struggle. It was in that moment that I knew that God really did love me. No matter who I am, no matter who I strive to be, and no matter who I love. I discovered hope and courage in the marketplace where I found a man by the name of Brennan Manning who wrote the ragamuffin gospel, and he gave it to all of us. I discovered the revelation that God would not put another person on this earth for me to love and call that bad. And it was in that moment that I not only discovered my gospel story, but I was transformed by it. Later in my life, as I was fueled by education, encouragement, reason, and that spirit that moves within us, I discover that God is not small and manageable. Leviticus is not that black and white book that I once thought that it was. And it's not a story that squeezes the mystery out of God, making him easy to follow. By the grace of God, I discovered that there really is no more effort needed on our part to see another, to join another human being in their sacredness. All we have to do is be open to seeing shades of gray. All we have to do is be open to seeing shades of gray and to meet one another, share our stories, and encourage each other daily while it is still today, because, my friends, tomorrow may be too late. Paul understood this. He understood that discouragement is not an option, and it only leads to grief and systemic oppression. He knew that there is a solidarity in the sharing of stories and in the meeting of one another. And when we do so, we discover pivotal moments, pivotal moments that transform us, moments that help us find the path, moments of strength to ignore the poison societal values, moments to see the gifts in the marketplace of family, friends, and community, and the gift to be sprinkled clean by Jesus, who is God's ultimate high priest. As we reflect on the conflicts 
and the disputes among us. May we always, may we always encourage one another to love and to good deeds. And in doing so, may each of us discover our gospel story. Amen.